this first course is called U.S. History to 1865. Um, so, you know, when does uh, United States history, when does U.S. history begin? That's kind of a, qu a tricky, uh, a tricky question. I mean, technically, uh, United, the United States, the entity known as the United States, began uh, in 1789. So America, of course, uh, declared its independence via the Declaration of Independence written by Thomas Jefferson in 1776. Um, but we weren't quite independent yet. Uh, we just said, America just said that it was independent, right? Uh, the war had to be won, the War of Independence, the Revolutionary War had to be won. Uh, so Revolutionary War lasted for about seven or eight years, ended in 1783. And so you might say, well, at that point, uh, that was the beginning of the, of the United States, but that's actually not exactly the case. So the 13 British colonies uh, formed a sort of a confederation, a loose confeder uh, confederation of states. And we'll talk about this, uh, <clears throat> I think, in the... Uh, um, the second week of, of the course, uh, uh, talk about this more on the second week of the course. But anyway, the 13 British colonies formed sort of a loose confederation of states um, that were affiliated, affiliated with each other, but it wasn't exactly a United States kind of situation. Uh, America really became uh, a collection of states uh, that were united, i.e. the United States, upon uh, the ratification and adoption, implementation of the Constitution in 1789. Uh, so, you know, so again, when does the United States start? I mean, technically in 1789, uh, but certainly you have to talk about the American Revolution, you have to talk about the War of Independence, and we're going to do that. Uh, I think you have to go back much further as well to understand the antecedents um, the important precursors to what eventually became the United States starting in uh, around 1789, 1790. <laughs> so uh, you have to discuss certainly the British colonial period, British North America, the 13 colonies, uh, what life and politics and society and culture and economics were like uh, in the 13 colonies from Jamestown all the way to 1789. And, and kind of go from there. Um, but I think you have to go beyond that as well. Uh, and basically, you know, so the British came to dominate North America and out of the British domination of North America, uh, the United States was, was birthed as an independent English speaking nation, right? Uh, <coughs> but that was very contested. That wasn't preordained. It wasn't preordained uh, that uh, the British were going to come to dominate uh, most of, of North America. They had significant uh, competition from uh, the Spanish, from the French, even from the Dutch, uh, to a certain extent, uh, all having, they all had their colonial ventures in, in North America, and wars were fought, uh, really, all the way into the 19th century. Uh, like the War of 1812, that's really uh, at the end of the War of 1812, that's the end of the British in uh, essentially in, in North America or British competition with the United States of America for North America, uh, I should say. Uh, so yeah, really, um, uh, you can't just focus on Brit the British colonies. I think you have to focus on the French colonies in North America. You have to uh, focus on Spanish North America as well. And of course, indigenous North America, right? Uh, and how all these groups abide for uh, competition. Um, however, I think, I think it's important to um, talk about the Americas as well. So, uh, and I'll cover more about this in a few minutes, but uh, the beginning of European colonization of, of North America and said, ultimately settlement in North America, uh, it, it began with Columbus, right, uh, in 1492. Now it's said that Columbus, quote, discovered America Really, Columbus discovered the Americas, right? Columbus landed in what's now the Bahamas in, uh, in the Caribbean. Uh, Columbus didn't land in Washington, D.C. or something, right? So Columbus landed in the Bahamas. That set up um, the first century of colonization uh, and to a certain extent settlement in the Americas, which wasn't really for the most part focused on North America. It was focused on Central South America and the Caribbean. Um, and again, we'll, uh, we'll talk more about that, uh, but that was the beginning of European um, uh, adventures and influence in the Americas and the beginning of the Columbian Exchange, which we'll, we'll talk about. So I don't think you can, uh, in a class like this, just start with Jamestown in 1607, just start with the first British settlement, because British settlement in North America and other settlements in North America 
um, and what was happening with indigenous groups in North America was uh, influenced by in many different ways, biologically, politically, socially, uh, et cetera, by what the Spanish uh, originally did in Central and South America, basically Mesoamerica uh, and, and the Caribbean. So <clears throat> um, uh, let me dive into indigenous America. <clears throat> so in the McClay book, uh, he doesn't spend, he, he, he does certainly talk about um, indigenous peoples, but he doesn't spend a lot of time on pre-contact indigenous peoples. So prior to the arrival of Columbus, what was life like? Um, what characterized life in the Americas prior to European uh, arrival uh, around 1500, right? So I, I want to spend, because McClay doesn't spend a lot of time on this, I want to spend some time on this um, and kind of fill in some gaps. So Europeans, uh, of course, called the Americas, quote, the new world. Um, but for the millions of Native Americans, Indigenous Americans they encountered in the New World, uh, this world was, of course, not a new world. It was a familiar world uh, to them, right? Uh, humans, in fact, have lived in the Americas for over 10,000 years. Dynamic and diverse, they spoke hundreds of languages and created thousands of distinct cultures. Uh, these Native Americans built settled communities and followed seasonal migration patterns. Uh, they maintained, uh, sorry, maintained peace through alliances. Uh, at times, but also warred with their neighbors <clears throat> uh, in many cases as well. They developed self-sufficient economies, uh, maintained vast trade networks. They cultivated distinct art forms as well and uh, adopted uh, uh, spiritual values. Um, kinship ties knit their communities together just like uh, was the case for thousands of years all over the world. Uh, however, the arrival of Europeans and the resulting global exchange of people, animals, plants, and, micro, uh, and uh, microbes, excuse me, germs, basically, uh, what we call the Columbian Exchange, which I'll, I'll talk more about, uh, bridged more than 10,000 years of geographic separation, uh, inaugurated centuries of violence, unleashed the greatest biological terror the world has ever seen. <clears throat> so in short, just fix my notes here, uh, in short, the arrival of Europeans, starting with Columbus around 1500, <laughs> um, revolutionized the history of the world. I mean, that's a, a bold statement, but I don't think it's an exaggeration. So uh, it began one of the most consequential developments really in all of human history, uh, the merging of the Eastern Hemisphere and the Western Hemisphere, uh, the merging of the Old World and the New World. So let's get into life pre-contact in the Americas pre-contact, right? So how many people lived in the Americas pre-contact? So scholars um, used to think that uh, basically there weren't very many people here. Um, so uh, even you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, it was commonplace for estimates to range from 4 million, 6 million, 7 million people uh, in North America, Central America, South America, the Caribbean. Uh, but scholars in more recent times have revise those estimates upwards uh, dramatically, right? So some scholars think it was around 50 million people. Uh, others think it was 70 million. I've heard estimates go as high as 100 million. So let's split the difference and say there were 70 million people living here, uh, living in the Americas, living in the Western Hemisphere prior to European uh, arrival, prior to you know pre-Columbus, pre essentially. <clears throat> um, so that's pretty astonishing. Now, most of those people lived in Central and South America, not North America. That's important to keep in mind. Uh, and I'll, I'll come back to that as well. So how did they get here? Well, the last global ice age trapped much of the world's water in enormous continental glaciers. Uh, 20,000 years ago, ice sheets some a mile thick extended uh, across North America as far south as modern day Illinois. Uh, with so much of the world's water captured in these massive ice sheets, uh, global sea levels were much lower and a land bridge connected uh, Asia and North America across the Bering Strait. So between, um, scholars think between something like 12 and 20,000 years ago, native ancestors crossed the ice, the waters, uh, the exposed land um, between the continents of Asia and America. So these mobile hunter-gatherers traveled in small bands, exploiting vegetable, animal, uh, and marine resources uh, in basically what's now Alaska uh, in the northwest corner of uh, North America, um, and eventually made their way down to the southern part of North America, what's now the United States, basically, uh, to Central America, to the Caribbean, uh, into South America, and all the way to the tip of 
you know, the bottom tip of South America to, you know, places like Patagonia, um, modern day Southern uh, Chile. <clears throat> um, so uh, take a look at this picture. If I've set this up right, hopefully you can uh, see the picture on uh, the other the other side of the screen. So uh, I'll just read the caption. This is a, a rendering of a prehistoric settlement in Warren County, Mississippi. Um, and this kind of sets the stage for a discussion of pre-contact North America, pre-contact North America. Uh, so agriculture flourished in the fertile river valleys between the Mississippi River and the Atlantic Ocean in this pre-contact uh, context, an area known as the Eastern Woodlands. So there, uh, three crops in particular, corn, beans, and squash, known as the Three Sisters, again, that's corn, beans, and squash, known as the, quote, Three Sisters, uh, provided nutritional needs necessary to, to uh, sustain cities and even civilizations. On woodland areas from the Great Lakes and the Mississippi River to the Atlantic coast, Native communities managed uh, their forest resources by burning underbrush to create vast park-like park -like hunting grounds and to clear the ground for planting the Three Sisters. Uh, many groups used shifting cultivation in which farmers cut the forest, uh, burned the undergrowth, and then planted the seeds in the nutrient-rich ashes. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, I have a bit of a, a cold, so uh, bear with me. So, um, man, let me just kind of comment on this, right? So think about what I just said. Um, this maybe runs contrary to certain preconceived notions about indigenous peoples, about Native, uh, Native Americans in this case, right? Uh, so Native Americans weren't all hunter-gatherers, right? Many of them uh, practiced agriculture. And if you think about it, agriculture by definition involves essentially hacking. Um, uh, disrupting in some way uh, the natural landscape to create a reliable and nourishing food supply, right? So there's, um, uh, I think this kind of cuts against preconceived notions of indigenous peoples uh, that, that a lot of people have, which is that indig uh, indigenous peoples cultural makeup, uh, it's, it's inherent in indigenous culture to try and manipulate nature, uh, nature to suit your own purposes. Um, sorry, it's, let me, it's the opposite of that. Uh, it's inherent in indigenous people's culture uh, to have an aversion to not try to manipulate nature to suit their own purposes. That's something Europeans do. Uh, I think it's commonly thought that's not something that indigenous people do, especially prior to the con prior to the arrival of Europeans in, in a place like North America. Uh, but that's just uh, just not true, right? So many of them practiced agriculture. Again, agriculture is essentially a hack of you know um, of the natural environment, if you think about it. Um, so yeah, uh, uh, and also, um, as I mentioned a second ago, Native communities manage their forest resources by burning underbrush uh, to create vast park-like hunting grounds and to create, uh, to clear the ground for planting the Three Sisters, right? So <clears throat> um, yeah, so they would um, clear out forests to make things uh, easier for, for hunting, right? So they manipulated the landscape just like Europeans manipulated the landscape. Um, now, that's not to say that there's not important differences between Europeans on the one hand and indigenous groups on the other hand. And they, let me kind of talk about this. Um, and what I'm about to say does not uh, preclude the fact that um, indigenous peoples uh, there's uh, an almost infinite uh, variety, and especially there was an almost inf infinite variety of indigenous peoples, right? And uh, especially prior to European contact, and this is true of Africans as well. So prior to Europeans um, making their way to Africa via the transatlantic slave trade, prior to Europeans making their way to the Americas and encountering native peoples and settling and, and encroaching on native land, uh, and coming into conflict in many cases with, with native uh, groups, native nations. Um, the uh, indigenous peoples and, and African peoples as well, uh, typically didn't see themselves as like indigenous or African, right? They associated uh, themselves with their tribe, with their group. Um, and they didn't feel necessarily a kinship with uh, another indigenous group, especially a group that lived on the other side of the North American continent, for example. And again, I, I would say the same thing is true in Africa. Now, uh, that being said, um, there's uh, certainly there's important differences between Europeans and indigenous peoples, right? Uh, and also Europeans arriving in the Americas uh, and the set of developments and events that that 
sort of set off um, that in many cases <clears throat> facilitated native peoples to join together and to, to a certain extent, see themselves as, um, <clears throat> as possessing a shared identity. Um, if for no other reason, then they were, in, you know, in opposition to uh, European incursion on on their land, and, uh, and and that kind of thing. So anyway, North America's indigenous people shared some broad traits, spiritual practices, understandings of property, and kinship networks differed markedly from European arrangements. Uh, most Native Americans did not neat, uh, neatly distinguish between the natural and the supernatural, for example. Uh, spiritual power uh, permeated their world and was both tangible and accessible. It could be appealed to and harnessed. Um, kinship bound most Native American, uh, Native North American people together. Most people lived in small communities tied by kinship uh, networks. Many Native cultures understood ancestry as matrilineal as well. And this means that the family and clan identity proceeded along the female line through mothers and daughters rather than fathers and sons. Uh, fathers, for instance, often join mothers extended families um, and uh, sometimes even uh, a mother's brother or brothers, uh, multiple brothers, um, took a more direct role in child rearing, child raising than that child's bi biological father. So suffice it to say, that's very different than the European concept, uh, European conceptions of like family, what characterized family, family structure, family hierarchy, uh, et cetera. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> excuse me. Therefore, uh, mothers often wield an enormous influence uh, at local levels uh, in indigenous society. And men's identities and influence often depended on their relationship to women. Native American culture, meanwhile, generally afforded greater sexual and marital freedom than European cultures. Women, for instance, often chose their husband, uh, husbands, uh, and divorce was often um, a relatively simple and straightforward process. Moreover, most Native people's notions of property rights differed markedly from those of Europeans. Um, Native Americans generally recognized, <coughs> excuse me, uh, generally recognized personal ownership of tools, weapons, and other items uh, that were actively used. Um, and the same rule applied to land and crops. <coughs> excuse me. So groups and individuals exploited particular pieces of land and used violence or negotiation to exclude others. Um, but here's the difference with Europeans. Uh, the right to the use of the land did not imply the right to its permanent possession. Um, so again, this is sort of a myth about Native Americans uh, that I think some people hold. Um, that I, I wanted to dispel to a certain extent, right? So some people um, had the idea that indigenous peoples uh, especially in a pre-contact context, um, do, you know, didn't really have a concept of property. Uh, and that, that's definitely not true, right? Indigenous peoples um, recognize property ownership. Their concept of property ownership was in some cases different than European concept. The European concept of property ownership, especially when it came to land, right? So property, according to the indigenous conception, um, uh, basically something, uh, something was your property, you own something when you actively used it, right? That was a precondition of property ownership. So uh, if, I, um, if I used land to harvest crops, so I planted uh, the seeds and I, me and my family harvested the crops, those are my crops. They don't belong to, to anyone else, right? So they, um, Native Americans had a concept of you know, ownership and, and property. Uh, it's just that um, when it comes to land, it's a little bit different, right? The right to the use of land, um, which they believed in as well, um, didn't imply the right to its permanent, <clears throat> to its permanent possession, right? Um, so the active use of the land um, uh, sort of imply, in, inherently implied uh, ownership of the land, right? Uh, but Possession of the land in perpetuity, that was a European concept, not an indigenous concept necessarily. Okay, let's get to the second slide here. So this is an artist's rendering of Cahokia uh, as it may have appeared in 1150 CE. Okay, so yeah, I'm gonna talk about Cahokia, um, which you might've heard of, let's see. <coughs> So roughly a thousand years ago, the largest Mississippian settlement, Cahokia, uh, located just east of modern-day St. Louis, peaked at a population of about 
uh, of between 10,000 and 30,000 uh, people. It rivaled contemporary European cities in size. Uh, no city north of Mexico, in fact, uh, would match Cahokia's peak, peak population levels until after the American Revolution. So think about that, 10 to 30,000 people doesn't sound very big by modern day standards, but um, around the turn of the 19th century, so just after the American Revolution, uh, the major um, seaport cities, the major urban uh, East Coast, East, Eastern seaboard cities like Philadelphia, to a certain extent Baltimore, New York City, Boston, um, didn't uh, have populations that matched Cahokia's until about the 19th century, the early 19th century. So uh, that gives you an idea of the size of the civiliz uh, civilization uh, and the population levels uh, that are uh, that that were uh, extant. Uh, that existed in Cahokia. <clears throat> the city itself being 2,000 acres and centered on Monk's Mound, a large earthen hill that rose 10 stories and was larger at its base than the pyramids of Egypt. Uh, as with many people who lived in the woodlands, life and death in Cahokia, um, life and death in Cahokia were linked uh, to the movement of the stars, the sun, and the moon. And their ceremonial earthwork um, structures reflect these important structuring forces. So Cahokia, excuse me, <clears throat> was politically organized around chiefdoms, a hierarchical clan, uh, clan based system that gave leaders both secular and sacred authority. Um, social stratification was also a feature of Cahokia. Uh, and this was part of uh, this stratification, this inequality, social and, and political and economic inequality was partly preserved through frequent warfare in Cahokia. So war captives were enslaved and these captives formed an important part of the economy in uh, the North American Southeast. North American slavery uh, was actually not based on holding people as property. Instead, Native Americans understood the enslaved people, enslaved people, uh, as people who lack uh, who um, lack kinship networks. Slavery then was not always a permanent condition. Very often, in fact, uh, a, formerly, a formerly enslaved person could become a fully integrated member of the community. Uh, also adoption or marriage can enable an enslaved person to enter a kinship network and join the community. Slavery and captive trading actually uh, became an important way that many native communities, uh, including in, in Cahokia, uh, regrew and uh, gained uh, or even maintained their power. <clears throat> so let me kind of uh, zoom out a little bit here. So it, again, there's another um, kind of false perception that Europeans brought slavery to the Americas. And I mean, there's a kernel of truth to that. They, it's more accurate to say that Europe, Europeans brought a, Euro, a more European, a more Eurocentric version of slavery to the North American upon, uh, to, to North America and the Americas uh, upon their arrival. But slavery existed in North America uh, prior to European arrival. Now, uh, this type of slavery was different. It wasn't what we call chattel slavery, right? Um, and I'll, I'll probably spend more time on this when, definitely spend more time on this when we get to slavery, uh, which I'm going to talk about, I think, in, in part two of uh, the uh, lecture for this week. <clears throat> Excuse me. But basically, slavery uh, wasn't considered a permanent condition. Um, so, for example, if a child was born of of a uh, an enslaved person, that child would typically not uh, be automatically enslaved. So that child could become a member of the captives community. Uh, captives were used as a means of uh, what. Well, first of all, captives were um, uh, were captured were uh, put into slavery in the first place uh, via war, via warfare, right? So they're typically like war captives. <clears throat> um, and they were used in diplomacy by di different Native American uh, groups as a means of, of diplomacy in many cases. And again, slavery wasn't considered a permanent condition. And that was uh, in, uh, very much in contrary to European and what became uh, American uh, conceptions of, um, of slavery. Okay, um, around, <clears throat> excuse me, around 1050, Cahokia experienced what one archaeologist has called the Big Bang, which included, excuse me, going up here, uh, which included uh, a virtually instantaneous and pervasive shift in all things political, social, and ideological. So the population grew almost 500% in almost uh, in only a generation, and new people, uh, new people groups were absorbed into the city and its supported communities. By 1300, the once powerful city had undergone a series of strains that actually led to its collapse. 
Okay, let's go to picture three. Okay, this is a 16th century map of Tenochtitlan um, that shows the aesthetic beauty and advanced infrastructure of the great Aztec city. Okay, oops, hold on. So we're gonna talk about pre-contact Central and South America. And let me just make sure my phone doesn't go off here again. There we go, hopefully. Okay, so the massive, uh, the massive empires of Central and South America were civilizations that dwarfed anything found in North America. In Central America, the Mayan, uh, the Maya built massive temples, sustained large populations, and constructed a complex and long-lasting civilization with the written language, advanced mathematics, uh, stunningly accurate calendars. Uh, but Maya civilization, although it not, had not completely disappeared, nevertheless collapsed before Europeans arrived uh, in the early 1500s, likely because of droughts and unsustainable agricultural practices. But the eclipse of the Maya, <clears throat> the Maya civilization, only herald, uh, heralded the later rise of the most powerful native civilization ever seen in uh, the Western Hemisphere, and that was the Aztecs, the Aztecs. So the Aztecs were actually militaristic migrants um, who, uh, who were native to northern Mexico. Um, the Aztecs moved south into the Valley of Mexico, what's now Mexico City in and around Mexico City, conquered their way to dominance and built the largest empire in the New World. When the Spaniards arrived in Mexico, they found a sprawling civilization centered around uh, Tenochtitlan, lots of things popping up on my computer here, um, centered around Tenochtitlan, an awe-inspiring city built on a series of natural and man-made islands in the middle of Lake Texcoco, located within modern-day Mexico City. Tenochtitlan, founded in 1325, rivaled the world's, uh, the world's largest cities in size and grandeur. Um, when uh, the, uh, who we call conquistadors, when the Spanish basically arrived in the early 1500s, uh, when they arrived in Tenochtitlan, they couldn't believe what they saw. Um, and by, uh, first of all, they saw a massive pyramid uh, located in the center of the city that uh, actually the ruins can still be found in <clears throat> uh, in Mexico City, the ruins of, of this pyramid. And uh, yeah, when the Spaniards arrived, they could seriously believe what they saw. They saw um, some, you know, some estimates say 70,000 buildings uh, housing uh, perhaps 200,000 to 250,000 people, um, all built on a lake and connected by causeways and canals. Bernal uh, Diaz del, uh, del Castillo, who was a, a Spanish soldier, later recalled, quote, when we saw so many cities and villages built uh, in the water and other great towns on dry land, we were amazed and said it was like the enchantment. Some of our soldiers even asked whether the things that we saw were not a dream. I do not know how to describe it. Um, seeing things as we did that had never been uh, heard of or seen before, not even dreamed about. <clears throat> so from their island city, the Aztecs dominated an enormous swath of Central and Southern Mesoamerica. Uh, Mesoamerica. They ruled their empire through a decentralized uh, network of subject peoples that paid regular tribute, including everything from the most basic items, such as corn, beans, uh, and other foodstuffs, to luxury goods such as jade, cacao, and gold, and provided troops for the Aztec empire. Um, however, this made the Aztecs um, not very, uh, as you can imagine, not very popular, um, where they sort of ruled with an iron fist, right? So these other indigenous groups kind of saw them as, uh, as uh, authoritarian interlopers, right? Essentially colonizers. And when the Europeans arrived, um, one of the reasons uh, the Spanish were able to um, decimate Aztec civilization so completely and so uh, quickly was the fact that these rival groups really hated the Aztecs, right? If the Aztecs could have, if these other groups could have aligned themselves with the Aztecs, um, uh, history could have, you know, potentially turned out differently, uh, but the Aztecs were widely uh, loathed, widely hated. So that's important to, to sort of keep in mind. Okay, uh, far, further south along the Andes Mountains in South America um, was, Inca, uh, was the Incan civilization. The Incas um, managed a, a vast mountain empire from their capital in Cuzco in the uh, Andean Highlands through conquest and negotiation, the Aztecs built an empire that stretched around the Western half of the uh, South American continent <clears throat> from present day Ecuador to central Chile and Argentina. They cut terraces into the sides of mountains to farm fertile soil. And by the 1400s, they managed uh, a thousand miles of Indian roads that tied together perhaps 12 million people. 
Let me talk about the impact of, of disease. I mentioned this briefly before, but um, this uh, definitely deserves spending a few minutes on. So the impact of, of disease on indigenous people. So scholars estimate that in the first 130 years following European contact, some 95% of Native Americans perished. Let me repeat that. So uh, Europeans arrived right around 1500 uh, in 1492 to be pre uh, precise. So around 1620, 1630, and by the way, this, as I'll talk about in, in a few minutes here, this is about the time of the arrival of um, the pilgrims and about 10 years later, the Puritans in uh, New England in, Mass in what's now Massachusetts uh, in, in British North America. So um, by the time uh, the first peoples, uh, European peoples landed in what's now Massachusetts, 95% of Native Americans in the Americas had perished, right? Uh, at its worst, Europe's Black Death peaked at death rates of about 35%. <clears throat> so suffice it to say, uh, nothing else in history rivals the American demographic disaster brought on by the Columbian Exchange. A 10,000 year history of disease hit the new world in uh, uh, a relative, you know, basically an instant. Um, uh, diseases like, especially smallpox, but also typhus, bubonic plague, influenza, mumps, measles, um, affected indigenous populations, pandemics ravaged populations up and down the continents. Wave after wave of disease, uh, of disease crashed rel uh, relentlessly. Disease flung whole communities into chaos. <clears throat> Others, uh, it destroyed completely. Uh, I, I wanted to mention something about this as well. So again, disease is the most important factor in the decimation of, of Native American societies, Native American civilization. And of course there was, um, uh, incursions onto uh, essentially theft of Native American land and uh, uh, instances of violence against Native Americans, but uh, primarily we can attribute this to the spread of disease. And this um, uh, this helps me, I think, helps us emphasize the point or relates to the point uh, that what happened in Central and South America relates to what happened in North America in what eventually became the British colonies and eventually the United States, right? Because think about it, 95% of Native Americans had perished. There was a 95% population decline uh, by the time of European arrival in uh, Massachusetts, for example. Um, so that means that uh, Columbus arrived in 1492, other Spanish arrived shortly thereafter, uh, and uh, these microbes spread from Central South America, the Caribbean, all the way into North America throughout the uh, throughout Native uh, communities, um, spanning uh, North, basically the Americas in, in their entirety, right? Um, so, you know, disease uh, isn't something that just, in this case, stayed in um, Central and South America and the Caribbean, it made its way all the way up to North America. So that's another reason I think why we want to spend time on the Spanish in uh, uh, Spanish efforts in Mesoamerica. Uh, but of course, disease was only the most terrible in a cross hemispheric exchange of violence, culture, uh, trade, and peoples, the so called Colombian exchange, right? Uh, that followed in Columbus's wake. Uh, global diets, for, for instance, were transformed. The America's uh, calorie rich crops revolutionized old world agriculture and spawned a worldwide popula population boom. <clears throat> Many modern associations between food and geography are actually products of the Colombian exchange. So, for example, there were no potatoes in Ireland prior to the Colombian exchange. Uh, there were no tomatoes in Italy. So if you're eating spaghetti, if you're making spaghetti in Italy prior to the Colombian exchange, uh, there's not going to be tomato sauce, right? Because there were no, no tomatoes in Italy, no chocolate in Switzerland, no um, peppers in Thailand, right? Um, no oranges, no, excuse me, no oranges in Florida uh, as well, right? Um, Europeans, for their, part, uh, for their part, introduced uh, their domesticated animals to the New World. Uh, for example, pigs ran rampant, uh, rampant through the Americas, transforming the landscape uh, as they spread throughout both colonies. Horses spread as well, transforming the Native American cultures who adapted to the newly introduced animal. <clears throat> partly from trade, partly from the remnants of failed European expeditions, and partly from theft, indigenous people, uh, peoples um, acquired horses and, train, and these horses these domesticated animals transform Native American life, especially in the vast North American plains. Um, so the Columbian exchange transformed both sides of the Atlantic, uh, Atlantic 
but with dramatically disparate outcomes. New diseases wiped out entire civilizations in the Americas. Uh, well, newly um, imported, uh, uh, sorry, newly imported nutrient-rich foodstuffs enabled the European population boom. Spain benefited most immediately as the wealth of the Aztec and Incan Empire strengthened the Spanish uh, and, and their monarchy. Spain used its riches uh, acquired through mining uh, gold and, and silver. Uh, in places like Peru and modern day Mexico uh, to gain an advantage over other European uh, over other European nations, at least initially. Uh, but this, this advantage was soon uh, contested. Uh, so Spain basically dominated uh, New World colonization and to a certain extent settlement in the 1500s. But <clears throat> around the 1600s, we see the arrival of Portugal, France, uh, the Netherlands, the Dutch, right? <clears throat> uh, and the British, starting with Jamestown in 1607, uh, who all raised to the New World, eager to match the gains of the Spanish. Um, Native peoples greeted these new visitors with a variety of responses, in some cases seeking to benefit from cooperation with them and trade with, uh, with these European uh, colonizers, settlers, um, adventurers, but in some cases, uh, uh, greeting them with uh, aggressive uh, violence, right? Um, but of course, the ravages of disease and the possibility of new trading relationships enabled Europeans to create settlements all along the Western rim of the Atlantic world. New empires would emerge from these tenuous beginnings, and by the end of the 17th century, Spain would lose its privileged position to its rivals like uh, France and, and England, right? Um, an age of colonization had begun, and with it, a great collision of cultures commenced. Okay, so I'm going to end part one of the video there, and we will pick it up with part two. Okay, I'll see you for, for part two.